The Lindstrom Historical Society presents Nia Duvamala, The Carl Oscar House, an inspiration to author Wilhelm Moberg of the Immigrant Series. Oh, hi. Welcome. Welcome to Nia Duvamola, Carl Oscar and Christina's house. They lived here about 150 years ago, and we wish to show you how they lived and some of the things they lived with. Welcome to Nia the Duvamola, Harry Lindstrom. Please come in. Before we tour the house, a little background. There was a massive emigration from Sweden to America at the end of the 19th century. Wilhelm Moberg, a prominent Swedish author, wrote a four-volume series about this in the 1950s. Moberg came to the Chisago Lakes area for three months in 1948 to research and collect material for his award-winning series, The Emigrants. He rode a bicycle around town, collecting interviews, reading old newspapers, gathering material at museums and homes and cemeteries. The heroes of his books, Carl Oscar and Christina, emigrate to the Lindstrom area, and the house you are about to see was chosen by Moberg as the model for the home that Carl Oscar would have built for Christina to live out their final days. This house was actually built in 1862 by Carl Lind, who was a member of the first group to settle in this area. The Lindstrom Historical Society has volunteered a huge amount of time and effort to move and restore this house as you see it. Let's go inside now and see why it's so special. Welcome and please sign our guest book and our tour guides will be with you in just a moment. Hi, I'm Elaine. I'm one of the tour guides. As you look around in this room, you will see that it, we have tried to place items just like they would have had. Now, if you look around, this is the main living area. They burned wood. This is restored from that time, the stove that burned the wood. And I want you to just change your mind here a little bit and go back in time. This is an old farmhouse that was Carl Lind's farmhouse. And when Wilhelm Moberg was here, the author of The Immigrants, he chose this house to be the pretend house for Carl and Christina to live in for the rest of their life. If you have read the books by Wilhelm Moberg, you will remember that Christina had a daybed. This is her daybed. This is a replica of what Christina would have had. We treasure this item perhaps more than anything in this house. Uh, it tells the story. This is where she would rest. And this is where, in the end, she, would, she reclined to look out the window and watch her apple tree. There's an astrakhan apple tree in view from the window. And this is what Christina, when she died, this is where she spent her time and where she was lying at that time and viewing the astrakhan apple, her own tree. And this is one of the bedrooms. And you'll notice, first of all, that it's quite small. Rooms were small. We're heating with wood, and we've got a central stove. So rooms were small, surrounded the main living area. These are typical items that you would find in the bedrooms. A washstand, pitcher with water, a lamp, some of the items which they would have used. Also, here's a small cot. In Sweden, all beds are single. There are no double beds in Sweden. When you go there today, you'll find that's true. There's some articles here, a musical instrument, and a shawl from the past, pictures, a spinning wheel, very important. And here's a costume, a full dress costume with the shawl from Sweden. Most of these items have been donated and treasured, and we really enjoy showing them. Also on the wall, you'll notice pictures. This is, this is something that they make in Sweden. Um, they really treasure these. I was told by one of our visitors that this should be framed because it was very valuable. So that is something we hope to do or plan to do. She said that's worth a lot of money. It's very valuable. This is the original wood, the wide white fur. Um, this is how they lived. And we try to um, 
keep it as much as possible the way that it was. Let's go take a look at the second bedroom. You'll notice we'll go by the central heating here, which heated the entire floor and the upstairs. I'll take you into the second bedroom, just as small. This is the children's bedroom. There's a commode with a little potty in. Some of you may have seen that before, some of you may not, but that's where we train the little ones. Here are some gowns that were original that have come from Sweden that we try to keep in good shape as much as possible. Um, it's After all this time, it's really difficult to try to keep them up or to do anything except dust them off and try to keep them. Here's a cradle, a handmade cradle. This actually was used by a local family. It's handmade and it was made here for somebody's children. A little homemade stool and a trunk. J.A. Carlson, this is a trunk that came from Sweden and you'll notice that it came to this area and that it was given to us by that family. A real treasure, rocking chair. Every little one has to be rocked to sleep. So this is how the children were and right next door to the other bedroom. All in close quarters just so that you could be near them and also so that you could hear them at night and keep them warm. We're back into the main living area and I'd like to show you this is a sideboard this cabinet it was handmade here by Swedish immigrants to this country and this is the style that they would prefer and probably brought from home and in this sideboard they kept all their valuables their way of life always families had china most of them had individual patterns uh, different kinds we have just a representation of that but every family that I've known that came had their own china their own glassware and just valued that so that was kept in this cabinet this sideboard also they were keeping their books and their reading material the Bible was very important their religious material they they did they did worship as a family and that was a big item for them took a lot of time when the family was all together here and any, fa any valuable book, they were well educated, any books that they had were kept in a sideboard like this and anything that they valued and used as a family was kept in this sideboard while they were all together as a family here. We have an old sewing machine and some items that may have been used, some of the carded wool and some things from the spinning wheel and this is the way they lived and most of their living was done in this main area. And this is the kitchen area and I, I want you to know that this is not the size of the original kitchen. The original kitchen extended quite a bit further in that direction. Their farmhouses were not small kitchens. So what happened is they had a fire and that part of it was removed which left us with this much smaller kitchen. We have table chairs, kitchen table chairs. We have a cabinet here with many of our items uh, from the past. Some of those things that I remember using when I was a child. We have sifter, all kinds of things that came from the past and that we've kept in our families over the years. There's a butter churn right here in the corner. And that was a very important item because they all did their own butter, made their own butter. Uh, I remember helping my grandmother with that. There's a coffee grinder from the past right here. They always had to grind their own coffee. Okay, here is the kitchen stove. This has been donated, restored, and repaired as much as possible to uh, be exactly the way it was. We have some uh, baking items from the past here, some of the things that were used. 
We have a little box there for matches to light the stove. We have some of the utensils, the teapot. This was to keep water warm during the day. This also, a lot of the stoves had a separate uh, compartment to keep water warm, but this one does not have that. This one has the feature though, which has a, a lid. It's a, it burns wood, and this has a lid that can be taken apart. The whole opening can be big, medium, or small. And that's a little bit different and very interesting. The oven, here's the ashes to remove from the wood here. And this is a warming oven. It's, um, it's, this opens, slides up into the stove, and this is where we kept the dinners be, well, until they came in from the field, whatever, kept items warm or kept things warm for those that were late in coming home. Wood box, back in the corner, table, chairs. This is a paddle and a mallet. And a, one like this was used at my grandma's as a butter bowl and um, patted the butter down and, and put it into the cooler. There's an old high chair right here next to the table. This is from the past and that is probably what the children were seated in when we ate. And here's an old kerosene lamp on the wall. And like I say, this kitchen would have been much bigger in that direction because we spent a lot of time in the kitchen, had a lot of room, a lot of memories were made around the food. That's important to the Swedes, especially some strong, strong black coffee. Now, if you're, if you come along, we're going to go upstairs and take a look at their upstairs quarters and where they slept. You come up a very narrow stairway. It always took as little room as possible. The homes were not large and the sleeping area was all one big area as you will notice. And here again we have some beds that are typical of what they used. A single bed again and a washstand and a potty, a commode for use during the night. And then we have a child's bed up here, which was more like a youth bed. Downstairs was the cradle. This is the youth bed. We have another potty chair up here. And all the, the rugs were hand loomed and made on a loom. And these were sewed together to make one large covering for the floor up here to keep it warm. The winters were really tough with one wood stove in the center of the house downstairs and the family would sleep in close quarters for safety because of the wood fires but also to keep warm and during the winter like I say a lot of the upstairs the door was closed and they would sleep downstairs around the stove just to keep warm in the winter because that's part of the stories that I've heard from my people other than that there's some items here from outside like a homemade pitchfork, a type of broom made from some branches, a steel cabinet, a washboard. We have some older items that have been given, some antique locks and knobs. It's been really interesting to see what has been donated here for our use and for showing. And a lot of people are very, very interested in all these items that we have on display. And they have a lot of questions about them. Some of them I know what they are, some of them I could only guess. And there again is an old board chest to keep items and store them away out of sight. And then on the other side of the room, we have a loom that was in the house when we received it and that loom has been restored and is usable today but this was in the original house but in ill repair so we had to fix that this is some um, fellow that knows the loom has worked on the loom and has it in working condition at this time and is doing some work for us and sometimes we're fortunate enough to have him out here when we have a tour so they can actually see how the loom works Hi, I'm Gary. I'm a recent immigrant to the area. I'm from German uh, Amish heritage from Ohio. And Alice enlisted me to help get this loom set up. I, I'm a weaver, 
So I could do that for, and I know a little bit of the history of it and how it was used in a homestead, an old homestead. The loom was built on site, I'm sure, or very nearby. Uh, they didn't carry something like this with them up the St. Croix. Uh, it is made so that it's completely teardownable. There's not a nail in the whole thing. It's all pegged and slotted. They took it apart in the summertime. They either stored it in the attic or outside. In the wintertime, they set it up probably right beside the fireplace where it was warm. It wasn't upstairs like this. And the weaver was not the woman of the household. It was probably the children. The weaving that was done was very, very basic weaving. This pattern is called hit and miss. It literally was any rag that they could get their hands on, sewn together with no pattern whatsoever, and just back and forth. The children did this, back and forth on the loom. No thought behind it. Now, as a weaver, on the same loom, I can make things that look like this. But this was not the kind of weaving they were doing. They were trying to cover their floors because it was cold. And they were using every scrap of material they could find. The, the two things that really stand out on this loom to me is there's no metal and the fact that it's completely teardownable. This is called a reed. This is metal, that's from my loom at home. This is the original reed that was on this loom. It is literally made of reeds from a swamp. I was afraid when I got up here and started working making rag rugs on it that I would destroy this old reed. So I brought one of the metal ones for my own. The heddles are all string heddles. This is called a, this is a heddle. It holds the, the pieces of string going through the warp. Uh, they're all hand tied. This is a, a board for tying them. Uh, these are just for making skeins of yarn that probably wasn't used all that much on the, the loom could have been. They would probably be uh, knitting and crocheting with that rather than using it on the loom. They weren't making their own cloth on this loom. They were just making very utilitarian things. You've been watching a quick tour of the Carl Oscar House, an interesting tribute to the Swedish immigrants who pioneered this area. There's more to see both inside and out. The large stone from Småland, Sweden, the Astrakhan apple trees, nearby Glader Cemetery, photo books of the move and restoration, and other attractions of Swedish influence in the Chisago Lakes area. Naya Duvamala welcomes summer visitors from across the United States and many from Sweden, including the King and Queen in 1996. The Lindstrom Historical Society thanks you for watching and hopes you can visit this little dove's nest sometime in the near future.